Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I wanted to explore Altium, which is a circuit and PCB design suite uh, that's very useful for designing your own custom circuit boards. One of the first things you'll want to learn to do is create your own custom libraries, because a lot of the built-in libraries or third-party libraries, sure they may have the components you need, but it's much easier to create your own and use those for future projects. So let's get started here. I'm going to go to File, New. We want Library. And let's start off with the schematic, because that's usually the first place you want to start. So over here in your left, you'll see your projects. This is uh, where you're going to have your actual library project here. Um, right now, it's not saved as anything. We'll do that in our next step. Down here, we have the Projects tab, which you're looking at now. You've got Libraries, which is a list of all the libraries that are already installed. You've got your schematic library. This is a list of everything in this particular library that you're creating. And the filter is one that I never use, so I'm actually just going to close that. So let's first start by saving this. And uh, so you want to go to, well, I'll create a new library directory. All right, and I'm going to call this, um, whoops, I did not like that. I'm going to go ahead and rename this. Don't really want schlib1, that's not a very good name. So I'm going to rename it to custom components. You can name it whatever you like. Let's save that. So here's our new schematic library. I'm going to go over to the schematic library tab here. And let's start by creating a component. I'm actually going to rename this one from the start. Let's get started with one of the most common ICs out on the market. Um, ICs usually start with a U designator, and then a little asterisk allows the schematic to automatically annotate it based on the schematic that the part is used in. Default comment, I'm going to just use the part number. So I'm going to do the LM555 timer. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and go to DigiKey and pull up its, web, uh, its data sheet. That looks about right. And I'm going to just stick with the DIP version for now because it's one of the most common ones. I'm going to open this up. And the really neat thing about DigiKey is it has the description, the part number, the manufacturer, everything right here, which is very convenient when you're creating a library. So I'm actually going to grab this part number because this is the actual one I'd like to create. I'm going to use that as the default comment. DigiKey also has the description. This is a fairly standard format. And I'm going to paste that in here. And it is a standard. You can also do graphical and mechanical components, but I'd like to stick with just electrical at this point. Now, over here are parameters that will show up when you export the bill of materials. And I tend to put in several. I um, like to do manufacturer one. Uh, value is the manufacturer, Fairchild. Do the uh, manufacturer one part number, which is once again the LM555CN. Doing copy and paste for all this to keep it simple. Um, you can do manufacturer two, manufacturer two part number, but I'm not going to worry about those here. I'm just going to add one more for notes. Now, this is especially useful if, for example, you're assembling a board and you don't want a component to be populated. So when you use this component, I would add in the notes DNP for do not populate. This allows the assembler to know that this component does not need to be assembled. So I'm going to hit OK on that. And I forgot to rename this. There we go. 
will reference down here. Okay. All right, so there's our blank area for creating our component. I'm going to try to make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. And uh, just some basic controls. Holding down the middle scroll wheel and moving your mouse back towards you zooms out. Moving the mouse forward zooms in. Hold down the right mouse button and you can pan. And those are probably some of the most common controls. The other one is using the mouse wheel to simply scroll up and down. Let's go back to the data sheet, or rather the, uh, the DigiKey page, and let's open the data sheet. So here's all of our information about the chip. Now, if you're not familiar with data sheets, I highly recommend learning what's included in a data sheet because they contain a lot of very important information regarding the component you're creating. In our case, we're really only worried about the pinout and the recommended PCB footprint, which is usually located down at the bottom. Those are the dimensions. There's a pad layout for uh, a surface mount. I'm looking for the dip version, but I'm not seeing that. But it's pretty straightforward. Each of these pins on a, on a standard dip, each pin is 0.1 inch apart. And then between the pins, uh, width-wise of the chip is 0 0.3 inches. Well, let's go back up to the pinout here. Actually, we might be able to use one of these example layouts here. You'll notice that the pins aren't exactly organized in order. Uh, this is to make drawing the schematic a bit easier. Most of the time, you want inputs on the left and outputs on the right. But if your schematic is cleaner doing it a different way, for example, in this one, then I would definitely go with the option that makes your schematic cleaner. So I'm actually going to use this one. I probably shouldn't have shrunk it down quite that much. Uh, zoom this out a little bit more. Stretch this out. Okay. So we'll start by creating an outline for the chip. This is done simply using the place. You want the rectangle. Altium is running a bit slow on this machine. Now, when you're hovering, you'll notice that the outline or the shape you're going to be creating is sticking to the mouse pointer. When you're in this mode, you can hit tab and you can change the, the, uh, the properties of that part that you're about to add. You know, for example, a rectangle, you can change the border width. You um, can draw it transparent so you can see through it. I don't usually bother with that. Um, so you can change the physical size, but I am just going to drag to do that. I'm going to click one corner. Move my mouse, and I'm going to click the opposite corner. There's our outline. I may have to adjust this later depending on how these pins fit in, but actually I think this is going to be perfect. The next thing we need to do is add the pins. So go to your place menu, pin. Alternately, I forgot to mention this earlier, right click to exit the command. You can use shortcuts. Notice that each of the first letters in the menu is underlined. Well, not each one, but most of them are underlined. All of them have an underlined letter. So if you press a key on your keyboard that matches up with that, for example, I'm going to hit P. That gives me whatever's in the place menu here. And I'm going to do pin. Notice this, the P is also underlined, so I can hit P again. And we have our pin. Once again, since it's floating, I'm going to hit tab and change the properties. Um, I want to start with pin 1. Um, actually, I goofed that up there. This is going to be the display name. So pin 1 on the 555 timer is ground. I'm going to type in ground. It's not a passive pin, it's a power pin, so I'm going to change this to power. And also, I like to keep the pins as short as possible. So I'm actually going to change that to 10, just to keep it neat. That's everything you really have to do here. You can change if you want these visible or not. I'm going to go ahead and leave them both visible, because it's good to see the display name and the pin number on the schematic. So I'm going to hit OK. Panning is a little goofy on this. Spacebar rotates anything that's floating. 
So I'm going to line up the ground right on the bottom, just like it is. Oops. Auto pan again. You can shut that off through the DXP preferences, but I'm not going to bother doing that here. But based on the schematic here, I'm going to put the ground right on the bottom here. I'm actually going to stretch this out a little bit because I'm worried that the text might start clashing. Let's make this nice and big. Another thing you can do, notice there's this wide separation distance here between the display name and the pin. I'm going to double click on the pin, brings up the properties window again. And I want to change the name position. So I'm going to hit customize position. Instead of margin of five, I like to change that to zero. And if you notice that right back here, let me go back here. It automatically updates the preview so you can see what's being changed. So I'm going to change that to zero. You can see it's much closer to the pin. I like that better personally. You can do the same thing with the pin number. Hit customize position. Instead of eight, I'm going to do one. Okay. So it's, it's much more consolidated now. And it's, I like that better. One more thing, I'm actually going to rotate the pin number and the ground label just because I don't like sideways labels. So in that same name position and font and designator position font, I'm going to change it from zero degrees to 90 degrees. Notice that automatically updates in there. And now everything is right side up. So let's place another pin. One cool thing in Altium is that when you create one pin, or when you create another pin, it automatically updates the designator number. I'm still going to change these to where we had them before. Uh, these don't need to be rotated because pin 2 is actually going to be on the side. Uh, apparently I can't scroll. Oh, there we go. Uh, pin 2 is on the side, so I'm not going to do that. Um, and this is not a power pin. Uh, the trigger is actually an input. So I'm going to hit an input. Uh, another thing is it's active low. So something you can do here when you're creating the display name, if you have an active low input, you want to put a bar along the top of the text, simply follow each letter that you want with a bar over it with a backslash. So in this case, I want to do trig, so backslash R, backslash I, backslash G, backslash. You can see in the uh, in the uh, preview here, it has a bar over it. I'm going to say OK to that. I'm going to rotate this. Whoops, I had it there. There we go. And I'm going to place that on the corner or the uh, edge of the box there. Do the same thing with out. So again, P for place and P for pin. And there's pin three. Notice it kept all of the settings from the last time. I really appreciate Altium having the uh, foresight to do that. It makes putting pins on a large component much simpler. Display name of pin 3 is going to be out. It is not active low, so I'm not going to use any slashes. Uh, it is, however, an output, not an input. I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to put the out the same place they put it over in the data sheet. Place pin. Pin 4 is reset. I call RST. And uh, reset is also active low. So actually, I'm going to put in. Can't type today. There we go. Active low reset. It is not an output. Is it, an, it is an input. And I'm going to put that right up at the top because usually it's connected to VCC. Because depending on your application, you may not ever want your 5x5 timer to be reset. So I'm going to put it up here. Once again, it's vertical, so I want to change this to 90 degrees. Make it all face the same direction. And actually, I was about to place this right here, but notice, you know, I'm going to place it there so you can take a look. Notice right here, the pin is actually facing the wrong direction. If you look very closely at the pins, you'll see one with these little dots. They're actually more like crosshairs. Those are the electrical connect points. So when you connect a wire to a pin, you want the wire to connect to that crosshair there. And if you have the pin oriented like this, that's going to be a really messy schematic. So this pin is actually upside down. So I'm going to rotate it, again, using the space bar. And that looks much better. Place pin once again. Pin 5 is the control voltage, so CTL. 
I uh, don't need this rotated. Oops. I'm going to put this right near the bottom here because usually it's connected straight to ground through a capacitor. And notice when I set one pin's location, it automatically updates and starts giving me the next pin, which is very useful for doing really large components. You can just place pins very quickly. Uh, pin six is going to be your threshold. I'm going to do THR for that. And uh, that is technically, I, I, I'm not sure if it's a, an input or an output. Um, I think it's an input because it's setting the threshold voltage uh, at which the 555 switches. But I'm just going to set it to passive for now because it's rarely used as, a, as a, its own separate input. Seven is discharge. Again, I'm just gonna leave that as passive. And finally, pin eight, which is power. And that's VCC. Now, this is a matter of preference, whether you use lowercase c's or uppercase c's. I've done it both ways. Um, just go with whatever you feel you prefer. I am, however, going to rotate this because this I would like to mount at the top. Oops, there goes the auto pan again. It's a little annoying. Once again, make sure that the display name is on the inside, the pin is on the outside. Now, if you look around, you'll see that all of these pins have the crosshairs on the outside. This is what you want, so you can connect the wires to the outside edge of the pins. Good way to check and make sure all your pins are the right way around. So there's a very basic 555 timer. It's a little sloppy. Uh, I would probably go back and clean this up a little bit, but for the purpose of this tutorial, um, I just wanted a basic schematic component to lay out here. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. And now we can get started on our PCB layout. So that means we need to start a new PCB library. So just as before, go to File, New, Library. We want PCB Library. Again, I'm sorry it's so slow. My laptop is not designed for CAD. Also going to make this full screen because we are done with this data sheet for now since it doesn't have the actual pad, the recommended pad layout. But that's okay. I happen to know it from memory. Uh, you can always Google 8-dip pad layout, uh, things like that, and it, you'll almost always come up with recommended footprints. So I think we're done here. First things first, I like to find the origin. I'm not actually seeing it here, which is a, a little odd. So I'm going to save this, save as. I'd like to save it in the same place that the PCB li or that the uh, schematic library saved, which is under Documents LTM Libraries, which is a directory I created earlier. And once again, I'd like to call this Custom Component. Don't want to save it as SCH lib because that's what we have over here. We want to save it as a PCB lib, which it automatically defaults to. So I'm going to hit save. And now we have our schematic library and our PCB library. Now the controls in the PCB library are very similar. Once again, we have the PCB filter, which I'm going to close. We have the projects. We have the existing libraries, which we aren't going to worry about right now because we're creating our own. And we have our PCB library. I'm going to double click this and change the name. I still have the part number in clipboard, so I just hit Control V to paste. And I closed out of that, but let's go back to DigiKey and pull the description. It's always good to make sure that these match the that the PCB li uh, library description or part description number match the schematic library part description and number. You can also add the height. Uh, usually you can get that from the data sheet. I'm not going to worry about that. So there we have our PCB component. 
once again, I'm not seeing the origin, which is unusual. Usually, in, uh, there's an origin that pops up in here somewhere. But let's uh, let's get going on the actual PCB footprint. Um, I want to change the grid. Since our component is a dip, um, I would like to put it on a. Well, the pins need to be on a 0.1 inch grid. I like to put it on a, a 50 mil grid, 0 0.05 inches. Um, so what I did is I hit Control G. And that brings up this grid editor here. I'm going to call that 0 0.5, well, 0 0.05 inches. Or rather, I'm going to change that to 50 mil, just because it's easier that way. Now I'm going to start placing the pads. So you go to Place, Pad. Similarly, if you notice the underlines, you can do P, P again. Right click to exit the command, P for place, P for pad. Once again, I'd like to hit tab. Now, the whole size really depends on the, the size of the pins on your part. So I'm going to go back to the dip, where it should show me the width of a single pin right here. We've got 15 mil to 21 mil here. So 30 mil, I think, will be fine, which is the default. I'm going to leave that as is. I prefer to keep the pad sizes about twice the diameter of the hole size. Uh, once again, we have the designator, which will actually match up with the pin number in the schematic. Um, and that's really all you need to worry about this page for now. Uh, now the aspect ratio is a little bit off, so you can't see, but there is a... Uh, and apply and an OK button down there. I'm just going to hit enter. Well, there's our pin or a pad rather. So I'm going to place this since we're on a 50 mil grid and we want to put a pad every 100 mil. I'm going to click once, skip, click another one, skip one. So th these are all 0.1 inch apart. And then between the different rows of pins, there's 0.3. So there's one, two, three. Can do the same thing. Take note of in your data sheet of the actual pin out. Dip start. If you face it with the notch or the dot on the left, and you're looking at the top of the component, pin one is on the bottom left, and then it goes down the side two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. And then it'll jump over to the other side and go all the way back up, counting up. It's sort of like a horseshoe shape, the way it's usually uh, numbered. So this is our basic pad layout for our 555. It doesn't really look very good. You can't really tell what it is. So I'm going to put in some uh, silk screen, an overlay showing where the outline of the component is. So I, I went to place line. I'm going to hit tab. And I'd, I'd like to put this on the top overlay. Uh, 10 mil is very huge. I would rather put it at 5 mil. Most silk screen I recommend having at 5 mil unless it's text, and then it depends on the size of your board and uh, how visible you want it to be. So I'm going to go up here. I'm going to just draw a basic. Whoops. Um, you'll notice that there are a couple of different modes for lines here. I want to just straight lines. You can click and just go up like that, but it automatically wants to create a 45 degree angle. If you hit shift space, it'll change the mode. Notice there's one type of curve. There's the right angle that I was looking for. It's also got a nice 90 degree curve. And you've got any angle. And then we're back to the 45 degree angle. So once again, I'd like the straight angle here. And I'm going to actually end this right here. So that we have a little bit of room to show our little notch. Uh, these ones are a bit tricky. I'd like to place an arc by the edge. Once again, make sure it's at 5 mil. Um, don't worry about the radius or anything right now. We just want to get it drawn. Bring it down here. It kind of it follows your mouse pointer, so it's, it's pretty intuitive. There's one arc, and we want to do the same thing over here, except I actually want to start from here in order to make it curve up. And there's our notch. So now we can see that if we're facing this with the notch at the left, pin one is in the bottom left, and it counts, the pin numbers count around in a horseshoe pattern. So there's our 555 timer footprint. Now I'm actually going to rename this because there are lots of components that have this dip eight footprint. So I am going to change this simply to dip eight. 
so that we can reuse it for other components with the same footprint. And for the description, it's an 8-pin dual in line package. Hit OK. And there we go. I'm going to save that. And I'm going to go back to our custom components library. And now we need to attach this footprint to this component. So to do that, I want to go to schematic library, double click this component here, the one that we're trying to attach the footprint to. And in the bottom right corner here, you'll see a, a pane called models. We want to click add footprint. Now we want to browse for it. And look at that, it automatically came up because the custom com components library, PCB library, is in the same directory as the custom components uh, schematic library. Uh, it won't always be, so you just have to browse for this library um, using this and then pick your footprint out of that list. So I'm going to go ahead and select div 8. OK. And it gives you a little preview here, which looks pretty good. I'm going to hit OK again. And OK again. Now you'll see down here, this little pane right here is now populated. It shows footprint that is connected to this component here. So I'm going to save this, the component, the custom components library. And that's basically all there is to it. Now, if you want to get a little more fancy, you can add a 3D model. Um, you've seen this, but if I do a 3D model, all you have is some silk screen, which is kind of ugly. So I'm going to go ahead and do that in this tutorial. Uh, by the way, you can switch between layer views by clicking one, which is more in the PCB design, looks at the board layout, which don't use for this. Two is the 2D layout, and three is the 3D layout. Those are actually using the number keys on your keyboard. I just hit two to go back to 2D. Now I'm going to open up a new tab here. The site I normally go through uh, to get third party 3D models is 3D Content Central.com. This site does require an account, but it's free um, and it's definitely worth it. I'm going to go ahead and log in. All right. Now that I'm logged in, I'm going to search the models for DIP8, which is the package name. You see, right off the top, we've got a few here. Um, I would really like one that is imperial. Um, I, if you create a footprint on an, on an imperial pitch, you do not want to use the metric pitch. So I'm going to go ahead and open this one up. I'm not sure if this is the right one, but we'll find out. Another thing you want to watch out for is some of these create some of the creators um, make their dip components with the legs, the pins splayed out a little bit, like they would be straight out of the package. You usually don't want that when adding it to a, uh, to a footprint. Like this, this is a good example. Notice these are splayed out. You don't really want that. I'm going to hit back. And I'm going to pick, I always prefer the, the nicest looking models. Uh, once again, don't use the metric ones because those, the, the pitch will be off slightly. You'll see there's all sorts of options here. I'm going to try this one. looks pretty nice. Um, now, I'm not sure if this is a metric pitch or not. Um, the creator did not say. But I'm going to risk it. I'm going to give it a try. Um, I always download the step model right here and AP214. Um, if you want to rate the model, um, the creators will greatly appreciate that. Uh, but I don't usually do that unless I, I feel strongly one way or another about the model. I'm going to hit download. Now, once again, you need an account in order to download, but it's free, uh, and I highly recommend it. So we'll just wait for this to figure. There we go. I'm going to download that. While that's downloading, I'm going to create a new component. Once again, I'd like to go to Documents, Altium, Libraries, I'm going to create a separate folder for models.
I'm gonna open that up. I'm gonna open this up. And I'm simply gonna drag the step model from the zip file into the models folder. Go back to Altium. Uh, once again, you want to be in 2D mode. You want to hit P for place and B for 3D body. It'll come up with this dialog. Once again, the aspect ratio is a little goofy. Let me see if I can. Uh, well, let me shrink it down. Um, we want to choose generic 3D model. We want to make sure it's embedded and then load from file. Now we're going to find that model that we just installed. Uh, it looks a little goofy. I'm not sure what's up. It seems to be missing pins there. So may want a different uh, different model. But I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'm just going to hit OK. Oops. Try that again. Ah, I think I'm saying load from file again. There we go. Uh, I hit tab to move down, and then I hit enter. Um, this one doesn't seem to be lining up. I'm going to go ahead and place this and see how it looks in 3D mode. Yeah, it is actually missing pins, which is a little strange. So I'm actually just going to delete that. Uh, but that's how you would attach a model anyway. Um, and once you save this, it would permanently attach to this model. So any component you add this model to will automatically have that 3D model as well. That's just a basic look at how to create a PCB and schematic library and how to link the components together. Um, I hope it helped. If you have any requests for tutorials, uh, feel free to leave it in the comments below. Uh, like, share, subscribe. If, any, if you know anybody that could benefit from this, uh, feel free to share it. And thank you for watching.